Good afternoon, everyone. We're pleased that you can join us for today's presentation. This is the third of our three-part series, Menopause, Body, Mind, and Spirit. This is presented by the Advisory Committee of the Lisa Stewart Women's Health Center. My name is Jane Tawney. I'm a physician assistant emeritus. Uh, I and two other advisory committee members who are, with, uh, who are Linda Robinson, certified nurse midwife, and Julie Havener, community midwife, got together and created um, this series. And we're blessed to be able to tap the talent and expertise of people on Mount Desert Island. Uh, Julie is not with us today because she's with a client. Um, this series is recorded and each episode is available for viewing uh, and reviewing on the hospital's website, which is mdihospital.org. You click on health centers and then click on Lisa Stewart Women's Health, Cent health Center and scroll down. And the series is at the bottom right side of the screen. There's some housekeeping details. Everyone is muted during the presentation. If you have a question or comment, please use the Q&A feature, which is on the uh, usually uh, located on the bottom uh, of the Zoom screen. And when you tap on it, um, a place to uh, type your question pops up on the right side. Um, Linda and I will be monitoring those questions throughout the presentation and we'll make sure they get addressed. Um, do not use your name in your questions uh, keep in keeping with our privacy policy. Today, we're focusing on spirit. Menopause is a stage of life when we often question and review what our purpose is and often find ourselves adrift, searching for renewal and faith. We often feel unconfident, confused, and depleted. Our three amazing panelists are here today to explore this with us and offer stories and tools to help guide us. And I'm so honored to uh, introduce you to them. Our first speaker is the Reverend Jane Corman. She has been an Episcopal priest for 16 years. For 14 years, she practiced ordained ministry in churches in Pennsylvania and in Maine. For the last two years, she has explored life and a ministry outside of the church. She currently works with Hospice of Hancock County, serving as the Bereavement Services Coordinator. She is the mother of two adult children. In addition to her meaningful human relationships, she shares her life with one very spoiled dog. I find that in menopause, sometimes our best friends are our pets. Our second presenter is Jen Harry. Jen works uh, in the Down East area, teaching mindfulness, meditation, resiliency skills. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology from P Pennsylvania State University is certified in the methods of Japanese psychology and is trained at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine and the Oxford Mindfulness Center. She received certification in both applied positive psychology and resilience training. She is passionate about helping empower people to soothe and calm their nervous system, navigating the ups and downs of life with more ease, opening a pathway for more joy and peace. I just want to mention that Joy uh, Jen has sorry Joy Jen has a new offering, which is Acadia Mindfulness Adventures. These are guided outdoor mindfulness walks, an opportunity to reduce stress and learn more about mindfulness or deepen your practice of mindfulness. She is offering a deeply discounted local special to our community, a two-hour mindfulness walk. We have a link to sign up for that, or contact Jen directly at Jen at ampersand jenharry.com. Our third presenter is Kathleen Bowman. Kathleen has practiced energy healing here on MDI for over 30 years. She has taught at MDI High School. She has worked as a macrobiotic chef and a cafe owner here in Bar Harbor. Kathleen trained in shiatsu, which is Japanese acupressure. She has expanded her skills to include Reiki, chakra healing, emotional freedom technique, also known as tapping, and nonviolent communication skills. Kathleen focuses on empowering people to understand and manage their energy. Kathleen always says, energy healing is not magic. It's simply the restoration of every person's birthright, a connection with her true essence. And you can find more information about her work on her website, kathleenbowman.com. So let's begin our exploration. 
Jane Cornman, you're first. Thank you, Jane. Um, and thank you for inviting me to be here today. Um, I have to, I want to start out by just saying that I never ever thought of spirituality and menopause as a combined topic until Jane Tawney called and asked me if I'd be willing to participate today. And um, my first thought was, oh my gosh, I, I don't know. I never thought about it, never studied it. Um, so it's been a great opportunity to think about it. And I am coming to you today. I, I am an Episcopal priest and I've watched some of the previous programs on the MDI website. Um, so I just wanted to say I'm coming to you as a so-called spirituality professional in the sense that I'm an Episcopal priest, but I am not here today with a list of spiritual practices to help you with getting through the changes of perimenopause. I'm actually just here as a woman who is in perimenopause whose life really turned upside down. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit of my story as a way of setting up the whole conversation. Uh, so I started this journey, I guess I would say, in my mid-40s when I needed to have a hysterectomy, and they left my ovaries in, so I knew that I was going to go through uh, perimenopause at the, the normal time in my life, but I would not have any signals um, from my body, specifically a period, to know what was going on. And I remember asking people when I had the hysterectomy, you know, how am I going to know when I'm going through perimenopause? And they'd say, oh, believe me, you will know when it's happening to you. Um, but it wasn't that obvious to me. I, I found out later from my mother that we don't typically get hot flashes in my family, and I really haven't had any. So I wasn't all that aware of it. Um, we moved to MDI. Um, I had a new job here in a parish. And my husband got a new job that was not as compatible with my job as his past jobs had been. And we were struggling through that. My kids were adolescent. They were going through their own issues and I was beginning to face empty nest and I was having a lot of trouble. So I decided to go to a therapist. And when I met with the therapist, she completely blew my mind by saying to me, have you considered that some of what you're experiencing right now is because you're in perimenopause? And I was, I just, I had never even thought of it. I wasn't having any physical manifestations of what I thought of as going through the change. Um, and no one had talked to me about it. I, I was on an antidepressant, but the person who prescribed it had never acknowledged that I was at the age to be going through perimenopause. Um, so this therapist really opened my eyes and she recommended that I read a book called The Wisdom of Menopause by Christine Northrup. Um, so I was like, okay. And I went home and I got this book and um, I have to tell you quite honestly that the book um, seemed completely way off base to me. Um, the author started out talking about her divorce and about changes in her career and the way she talked about it seemed completely alien to me. I, I just couldn't relate to a single thing she said. And I remember telling my husband, you know, I'm happy with my marriage and my career and my life. I don't expect I'm ever going to get divorced. I'm not going to radically change what I do or what I think. And this book isn't relevant to me at all. And I was, I was very disappointed. And um, to be honest, the book was threatening to me. And so I kind of judged the author and I stopped reading it. Um, so now I'm gonna skip over the three years that ensued and let you know that um, I came out of all of that divorced and having left my church ministry. Everything that I had fought to achieve and everything that I valued seemed like it had turned upside down and I had this strange sense that I wasn't really doing it consciously. Instead, it felt like it was something that was happening to me. And I often think about it in terms of childbirth. I have these memories of giving birth where all of a sudden my conscious analytical active brain just went away and my body took over and this crazy immense process happened and then there was a baby. <laughs> and going through this experience of these changes during perimenopause felt very much the same way. Um, it was like something just took over and everything turned upside down. 
Um, I have a vivid memory of um, being in the middle of one of the divorce arguments with my husband and daughter. And in the middle of all of that, my husband looked at me and went, you have changed. And I don't think I know who you are anymore. And he said that in, accusing, in a very accusing way, like changing was this terrible thing. Um, and it's so interesting to me that we call menopause the change. And we think of it more as a physical change, but everything can turn upside down. Um, I went from someone who dreaded the empty nest to someone who literally knocked the nest out of the tree. And I went from someone who feared losing my husband and expecting to spend the rest of my life with him to being someone who asked him for a divorce. And I, um, I had this belief that after years and years of discernment and preparation, I'd found my lifelong career. And then I left the church, again, of my own volition. Um, this was nothing like what I expected. Um, and it was serious business because I, I was and still am a priest. So regardless of whether people were members of my church or not, everyone knew that I was a spiritual leader in the community. I was expected to maintain higher standards than other people, to be steadfast in my marriage, to be dedicated to my work as a priest, and to have a deep and rich spiritual life that was so strong that I would be capable of helping others with their own spiritual journeys. Um, but when I went through it all, it felt like my spiritual life also turned completely upside down. Um, and suddenly I didn't know what, what it was okay to tell other people. And I'm still in the process of kind of reforming all of that. Um, I had lived a by the book, follow the rules kind of um, religious faith in the Christian tradition. And I had followed all of those rules, but nothing ended up the way I thought it was supposed to. And I suddenly seemed completely incapable of following the rules. Mm -hmm. So spirituality is about asking the big deep questions of life. Who am I? What is my purpose? How do I connect to something larger than myself? Um, what happens? You know, for some in some religious traditions, especially Christianity, there's a big focus on what happens at the end of life. And getting to this stage in our life, we start asking those big questions in a new way. And what I learned through personal experience is that living a tight, religiously constrictive spirituality um, is constricting and limiting. And I, for a long time, as I described, as I read that book to you at the very beginning, sometimes at allowing ourselves to ask big questions is very threatening, but if we can do it, it can become liberating. And I have come to believe that asking those big questions and being allowed to question everything and, and allowing ourselves the freedom and trust to ask those big questions is vital. Um, it takes a lot of work to pay attention to our deeper self and our human nature makes us want to avoid it. And I think I was living with a lot of avoidance. Um, but I also think, um, you know, going back and reading that book years later, um, Dr. Northrup talked about this idea of the, the lifting the fog of the hormonal veil that we've been living under in our childbearing years. And I definitely had that experience. Um, there's a sense of things opening up, losing blinders, um, seeing things in a new way. Um, and, and through that, coming to a place where we can embrace this. Um, and so one of the things that's so important to me is that I don't think of menopause as a horrible, awful thing, which is how our culture tends to look at it. I think it's, um, it's a new stage of life that can be embraced. Um, it's a time when you begin to pull together your sense of wisdom. Um, you look back at all of your experience and you learn that you can survive and that you can grow and that you have more to offer than you ever thought. Um, it's a time to reevaluate your priorities and, and make sure that you're focusing on what's the most important. And I'd say on a spiritual level, I think that what's imp most important to me from my tradition um, is learning how to um, live with an open-ended kind of spirituality. And what I mean by that is, um, for instance, in, in a life of prayer, 
rather than prayer just being something that you do to ask questions and find answers about what you're going to do in life, it's more of an opportunity to just sit with openness in the presence of um, God or the universe or whatever you choose to describe this, this other bigger thing than yourself. Um, and just sitting in that presence and listening, um, letting it um, help feed you, um, help you to experience love and forgiveness and growth and um, healing. Um, you know, I think part of menopause has to do with healing. We're, we're dealing with um, big issues in life and um, it can be a time to, to to come to terms with things. I, I find myself now going back to my early life more than I ever did before and really understanding it in ways that I never did before. And um, that has been my experience. And um, hopefully that's a, a good start for the conversation. And um, thank you for listening. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Jen. Thanks so much, Jane. Huh, it really is. It feels like an honor to be here today, and I'm really passionate about supporting women. Um, and before we get started, let's just all take a deep breath all the way in and all the way out. This is an easy way to calm and reset our nervous systems when we're feeling stressed and talking about all these big questions and challenges and the things that come up for us during this time. Uh, I'm in the midst and the muck of menopause myself. Um, and what I want to share with you today um, is the idea of self-compassion as a practice that we can use to help us deal with the challenges of menopause, um, to really deal with any challenges that come our way. Um, and also I wanna look at how we might be able to envision this time as an opportunity, um, an opportunity to create a new relationship with ourselves as we transition into this new phase of life, so similar to what Jane was talking about. So, um, you know, as women, we're really good at taking care of everybody else. Uh, we put all our time and our energy into taking care of those that we love um, and seeing that their needs are met. And we're so good at it that we often put aside our, our own comfort and care, uh, our own needs in order to do this. Um, and also, if you're like me, you might have a running commentary in your head talking to you about how you are doing things. Um, that sets these incredibly impossibly high standards for yourself um, and tends to often be super critical about what you do and how you're doing it. Can anybody relate to that? Those voices that are like, oh, you're not doing enough and all those things we hear in our mind. Yeah, and so we've got all this and we're living in the middle of a pandemic. And then here we are now uh, moving into menopause. And this is a time when everything is shifting and changing. Um, our bodies are changing, our moods are changing, sometimes faster than we can keep up. Uh, our thoughts and feelings are shifting. And sometimes it feels like it's really overwhelming or like things are a little bit out of control. Um, and so what I'd like to do is just take a moment for us to acknowledge that it's hard. Transitioning into a new stage of life is not easy. You know, suddenly we're finding ourselves at middle age. I just turned 50 and I'm like, how did that happen? <laughs> um, you know, we're grow our kids are growing up, our bodies are changing. We're letting go of our youth um, to be able to do things like we used to. I used to be able to stay up like half the night and still rock the next, the next day. And now I'm like finding myself in bed super early. I'm like, what's going on here? Um, you know, we're almost uh, losing a sense of ourself uh, during this you know, time and, and it's hard. And in mindfulness practice, uh, one of the most important parts of the practice uh, is bringing an attitude of kindness, gentleness, care, and compassion towards ourself and our experience. 
Um, and as women, we might be used to doing this for everyone else around us, um, but not so often for ourselves. Uh, so what I'd like to do is offer up a practice for us to try out that can help us uh, learn to be a little more or practice being a little more compassionate with ourselves. It's called the self-compassion break, and it comes from the work of Dr. Kristen Neff, who um, has been spent decades researching the benefits of self-compassion. So I invite everybody, hope you're game to try this out wherever you are, just settle in for a moment. Let's just take another deep breath all the way in and all the way out. And if you wish, you can close your eyes if you're comfortable doing so. Otherwise, you can just lower your gaze and allow it to soften. And this practice has three parts, which I'll guide you through. And the first part is to just acknowledge what's here to acknowledge our struggle. So we can just say to ourselves, whatever is going on for you, wherever you are, just you can say to yourself silently, this is hard. Or maybe this sucks. <laughs> or maybe this is stress. Or this is sadness or grief or whatever your experience is. Just take a moment to acknowledge what's here. And then I invite you to put a hand on your heart as a soothing gesture of compassion for yourself and your struggle. So often when we're struggling, we feel so alone. And so for the second step, we're gonna just connect into the general, um, to greater humanity. Uh, we can say to ourselves, we all struggle. Look at how many people are here listening to this talk today. How many women are going through these very same things right now all over the world. Uh, we can say to ourselves, I'm not alone. I'm not alone in this. And then third, the third step, we're going to offer ourselves some words of support and care. So we could you say things like, may I be kind to myself? May I give myself the compassion that I need? May I be strong? May I be patient? And when you can make it your own, make the words your own. Things like, sweetheart, you're going to get through this. Or, girl, you got this. Whatever feels right for you, just take a moment and offer some words of comfort to yourself. And then take another deep breath all the way in and all the way out. And just take a moment to sit with how this felt to offer kindness and care and support to yourself. And you can open your eyes when you're ready. Maybe it felt weird or strange or hard, and that's okay. Your experience will be whatever it is. Um, and often we're not used to offering ourselves this kind of care and support. And that's why it's called a practice. It's something we have to practice. Um, so I encourage you to practice this, this any time of day or night that you feel like you need it in any way that feels right or works best for you. You can experiment with it, make it your own, use your own words. You don't have to put the hand on your heart. You can if you want, you can imagine doing it. Um, but really the more we do this, the more it becomes a go-to of offering support to our own selves. I find it really empowering and helpful as I've gone through a lot of challenges um, through the past couple of years. Um, and there's also a lot of research on the benefits. You know, this practice is calming and self-soothing and it helps us re-regulate our nervous system, helps us get us out of our head when we're starting to spiral to those places we really don't wanna go and come back into our body. Uh, it helps us care for ourselves when we struggle. And if you do the hand on your heart, it, uh, touch releases oxytocin 
uh, often known as the feel-good hormone, and that has benefits for us physically, and it also lifts our mood, um, and it motivates us. Caring for ourselves in this way motivates us in a way that's all that self-criticism doesn't. There's a lot of research, you know, we think we have to be hard on ourselves uh, to get motivated and do things, but the research shows actually the opposite is true, that self-criticism um, makes it hard for us to do the things we want. So if we can bring this kind of care, we're more likely to be able to do that. Um, and it also makes us more resilient to whatever comes our way, knowing that we can handle it. And we've got, we, you know, we've got ourselves, we can support ourselves. Um, I find it really empowering. Um, and then lastly, I just really like us to, to envision this transition time in our lives as an opportunity. Um, it's an opportunity to renew or create a new gentle, caring relationship with ourselves. Uh, we can move forward into this new phase with the intention to honor and care for ourselves, um, to take care of our needs, our wants, our desires, our feelings, um, all the things that we might have been putting aside for so long to take care of a family, um, or a career, all those things we've been working so hard for, but in the process, maybe we've lost ourselves a little bit. Um, so I envision menopause um, and this transition as an opportunity to refocus, um, refocus our care on ourselves with that same gentleness, with the same kindness and tenderness and compassion that we easily offer out to other people. We can use this time to start to explore our own hearts and its desires, our own nourishment, and our own happiness. So I'd like to leave you with a couple questions here. Um, so if we see this stage of life as an opportunity for this new relationship with ourselves, what would that look like for you? How can you be kinder to yourself? How can you nourish yourself through this time? How can you care for yourself um, and explore what's most meaningful to you? And how can you do more of what fills you up? So those are some things to ponder because I think this is a time of opportunity like Jane was talking about um, for us really to explore these big questions and to start to take the time for ourselves that we've given out away for so very long. So, um, and finally, before I go, I just wanted to mention, tell you a quick thing. Uh, Jane Tawney had mentioned that I'm starting this new thing, Acadian Mindfulness Adventures, um, which are these guided mindfulness walks um, that give us an opportunity to learn some of these uh, stress relieving mindfulness practices in real life in nature. Um, and I know that nature uh, and the company of other women has been one of the most nourishing and healing things for me as I've gone through all kinds of challenges. Um, and I have been thinking that I'd really like to do some special walks for women. Um, and last week, Julie Hadner had said, you should do mindful uh, menopause walks. And I was like, that's a great idea. Um, and so, you know, if people are interested in something like this, please get in touch and uh, we could, so you can grab, you can gather up some friends or make some new friends. Uh, I'd love to schedule some of these special women's walks for our community, um, you know, because we're all in this together. Uh, and there's so many things that we can do that can really help us care for ourselves and increase our well being. So that's all I've got to say for now, but um, I could talk about these things all day, but I'm gonna stop because I know Kathleen has some wonderful things to offer us. Um, but thanks so much for listening. Unmute yourself, Kathleen. I muted myself because my windows are rattling. So in the wind. Um, hello everyone and thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you all and um, yeah it's wonderful. I love to talk about these things just as uh, Jen was saying. Um, so thanks for being here.
Uh, my name is Kathleen Bowman, and I'll be talking to you today about energy. And that's a subject which, to me, definitely falls under the umbrella of spirituality. Uh, I work with energy every day in myself and in others. And what is energy? And I have to say, I do not have a scientific definition for energy. Um, but in my experience, I know it as the silent, invisible current on which life rides. At any stage of life, including menopause, energy underpins everything. And that's not a doctrine that I'm giving to you. Uh, this is a concept that you can play around with, test it out. Um, it's a matter of personal discovery. Uh, and what does energy have to do with menopause? Well, I, I'll start by asking a few questions personal questions. Uh, have you been experiencing more anxiety during menopause? Have your emotional states been more intense? Do you feel stuck or unusually angry or sad or ashamed or ugly or depressed? Or like something's wrong and you don't know what? If so, chances are something is really happening energetically. It's not that nothing is happening, quite the opposite. In menopause, we may be sitting on a powerhouse, or in some cases, a keg of dynamite in the form of really suppressed energies. So the first thing to realize is that something is happening. I like to impress that on people. It's not, you're not stagnant. You may feel stuck in these states, but there's actually a lot of activity going on under your surface. There are strong forces working against your flow. Uh, these forces, they're not bad. Uh, they're just misplaced energy. This is known as an energy block. Energy blocks often come about from years and years of a negative core belief inside you, which has been constantly reinforced. And those core beliefs have strong energy that can limit us and drain our life force. Even just realizing that starts to shift things. Menopause is a huge transition and transitions are challenging because things are moving around or they're trying to. At times like these, energy blocks work even harder to hold us down. They may give us a double dose of negative messaging. It can feel discouraging, depressing, infuriating. It may bring on shame or lower our self-esteem. But understanding it consciously is a great first step. It could be that something that's been with me all my life, nagging me in the background is really rearing its head. At this time of this radical change. Some people, and I'm sure some of you and myself included, consider menopause to be a sacred shift. A time when we're called ever more deeply to be who we really are, our true selves. We not might not be able to see that though, when it gets really uncomfortable. And that's, that's okay, that's where Jen's self-compassion comes in. But there are ways we can work with ourselves to clear old energy blockages and wake up and actually feel the power of this passage. We live in a society that has planted seeds of belief in us, belief that as women, we have a certain place, we have certain roles, we're supposed to think of ourselves in a certain way and we're sanctioned if we dare think of ourselves in another way. Some would argue that, oh, that's how it used to be, but it's not that way anymore. I don't know about you guys, but I disagree with that. I think that's still pretty active. Um, back to menopause. Uh, in this transition time, the true self is once more trying to assert itself. That's where the opportunity lies. And it is often coming up against these old conditioned beliefs. These beliefs have energy. They are entrenched. They are waiting to be dislodged. There's work to be done. There are things to be reckoned with. There is a goddess within who may be howling or weeping or frantically knocking to get out. A goddess of creativity, wisdom, wildness and power. A goddess in chains. And it's no one's fault. It is part of the evolution of consciousness on earth. So this is a different slant, you know, on the matter from the hormonal approach, but they're both part of the same picture. 
ideally our energy and our hormones are working together in a holistic way, a collaboration. But often when the energy is imbalanced, the hormonal balances may also be affected. I'm reminded of something I read in Jane Horman. I, I also was reading uh, The Wisdom of Menopause during my menopause. I read this in um, The Wisdom of Menopause by Dr. Christiane Northrup, where she talks about certain indigenous groups in which women didn't experience very many problems during menopause. She attributed this to the way that they saw themselves, the place that they held in that society, the meaning that they ascribed to this transition time. It had an important place in tribal life. This is what I mean about the energy affecting the hormones and vice versa. Was their hormonal balance maintained because they were maintained and supported by the system in which they lived? Well, I think it's good food for thought. So let's talk about how to work with your energy more actively. How do you get consciously involved in creating more well being for yourself at this time and in turn for your environment and your world? And these are just a few initial ideas, just the tip of the iceberg. But um, you can see an energy practitioner, things like acupuncture, acupressure, Reiki, EMDR, EFT, also known as tapping, can sometimes give us the nudge, just that little nudge we need to move into a new phase. Another thing you do is launch an investigation into the certain core beliefs you have, which may be keeping you stuck or limited. Perhaps you'll notice a certain behavior and ask yourself, what core belief am I acting out with that thing I just did or said? You could also read up on how to identify and transform core beliefs. I have some of my favorite source books listed on my website. These, uh, my website is kathleenbowman.com. These books, are books that support the kind of work that I'm describing here. Another thing is you could talk about this with other people who are going through it. People you trust, people sharing honestly and vulnerably with purpose is powerful and subversive. You could find a safe place perhaps to dance or stomp or scream or pound pillows or punch or kick a bag, whatever might help your trapped emotional material to move. This is a way of taking charge of your own energy and not waiting for someone else to meet your needs. You could practice yoga with intention. And by that, I mean focus on yoga's ability to unblock energy and create flow. When you feel better after yoga, remind yourself that what you're feeling is your own energy flowing through its proper channels. Another thing you could do is use art or writing as ways to touch into yourself and your truth. I find the morning page is helpful in this. Uh, that's a technique that you can find in um, Julia Cameron's book, um, The Artist's Way. Also, you could look up proprioceptive writing and see if that appeals to you. I myself, I've really enjoyed making journals that combine writing with artwork. And you, you know, I'm not an artist and you don't have to be an artist to start to enjoy that right now. Uh, two books that I like on that subject are Journal Revolution, and Visual Chronicles by Linda Woods and Karen Danino. But there are many, many others on that subject. All, lastly, you could learn about nonviolent communication, which teaches us how to communicate with ourselves and others in a way that recognizes and honors everyone's feelings and needs. Nonviolent communication provides practices that can resolve conflicts and open hearts. So it is said that in menopause, you're entering into a new place. It's been repeated several times today, saying goodbye to an old life and encountering a new one. There's an invitation here in menopause, a kind of a call to action, to actively grab hold of the mystery of our own energy, to trade frustration for curiosity, and to gradually shake loose and set free your true self. So may everyone have a menopause that's a bit more positive and active as a result of our day here. And now I think there's gonna be a period for questions and answers. So I'll give it to Jane and Linda. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jane and Jen and Kathleen.
Um, and if anyone has questions, please type in the Q and A uh, column. Linda, do you have any thoughts or questions? Um, several. I mean, thank you all so much. They were those were just incredible, wise wise offerings and I'm so grateful to all of you. It's, um, it's, it's made me think of a few things and I, um, I, do, I have a couple questions actually and until we get some in the q and I'll, I'll just go ahead. Um, a couple things I wanted to say, um, be, you know, spending my career as a women's health practitioner and guiding women through childbirth, um, I have had quite a few comeuppances in my female hood. Um, I, you know, I learned about childhood, childbirth before I had children and really kind of um, arrogantly thought because I was so much better informed that labor and delivery would be a breeze for me because I knew what to expect. Well, that was so far off base. I, I was embarrassed with myself for even ever <laughs> like being that, that arrogant. I really had to learn to let go or this baby's not coming out. And I, um, I learned a lot from that, from going through that experience. And I found a sim not exactly the same, but a similar experience in menopause. I mean, I was fighting it. Um, I was 45 years old, had never missed a period, was active, happy, stable. I was thinking about this, Jane, as I was listening to your, <laughs> your life. And my story is a little bit different, but um, because it was not my choice for my marriage to end. My husband left abruptly and with no mm -hmm. explanation. And I was devastated. And because of that stress, I went into instant menopause. I mean, the whole nine yards, my period stopped. I had the hot flashes. And I think if it weren't for my circle of women friends who held me up through that, um, I just, I have no idea how I would have gotten through it. But, you know, but I did. I mean, through a lot of work and pain and heartache and grieving and, you know, all the rest of it, letting go. But I kind of, I, I kind of wish I had, had these offerings to kind of um, teach me a lesson about being kinder to myself because so much of it was, you know, I felt like such a failure. And I, as I look back at it now, as you were all talking, I was thinking about it. It wasn't unlike childbirth in that way of just letting letting go in a way that's um you know that that that's removed from an intellectual letting go like i like i honor older women i'm not worried about getting old you know i i don't have that stigma but um but my body was doing something that i wasn't happy with and i was still fighting that on a on a different uh, different level and, um, you know, as I've said many, many, many times to women in childbirth, it's like, you have no control over this. You have no control over this. It's like, once you accept it and, you know, trust that your body knows what it's doing, it's not easy or fun, but it is, you know, it will, the path will open up. And as you were, the three of you were speaking, I kind of, I felt like that was a similar lesson, you know, for for this stage of life. Anyway, I, there's, a, there's a question here that I'm just gonna read. So um, it is just a thank you to all of you um, and reassuring to see all of you as role models and um, part of this community. And again, I wanna reiterate how important that is at all stages of, of our lives, but but it is to have women, women surrounding you that are, um, that understand and understand the process is incredibly helpful and healing. We can't, we can't live apart from each other. So I don't know, Jane, did you? I, I, uh, I agree. I, one thing that I was thinking about when, um, especially Jen and, 
and Kathleen were talking is that the you know self compassion and moments of just being with yourself. I think that's so. I think that's particularly challenging um, for us in this era because there's so much chatter and so much um, intrusion upon our day, or our phone dings, or computer chirps, or you know all that kind of stuff. And I think also women in perimenopause at age 45, 50, you've got, you've got, you're trying to keep schedules for several people, often your children, your job, your, there's just so much coming in all the time that that just creates more, certainly stress and more, I think creates a lot of irritability. Linda and I've talked a lot about when, especially when I, uh, in our end of our working days, I be, had been on the computer all day, seeing people, but being on a computer, doing, getting email, doing, answering questions, seeing this, and you're just, you're just like done. And you're so irritable. And in the time of menopause, irritability is like, like number one, <laughs> your fuse is like way short. Um, and it's so, to even think you can have three seconds to say, I love you, you're, you know, and you think, I don't have time for that, but I, I hope we can convince um, everyone that just, even, just, just in passing, just do that. Take a breath, say, I've, I've, got, I've got your back. Everybody else may not because they're screaming and yelling and being selfish and you know, carrying on and everybody sucks, you know, <laughs> you know how you feel, you're just like, but, but to say, but I'm, I'm here and I'm standing. And um, I remember when Hannah, my daughter died, um, looking at myself and I was so devastated, but I remember looking at myself in the mirror and saying, Jane, you are here. You're here. You're just here. And a friend of mine saying, all you have to do, Jane, is breathe in and breathe out. That's all you have to do. That's all you have to do. And that was a very, very um, devastating, obviously, time for me and would be for anybody. But it doesn't take that kind of devastation to just say to yourself, I'm here. I'm, I'm here. I'm just going to breathe in and out. And I, I'm just gonna do this um whether it's a bad day a bad marriage uh a bad it, it, you know things that are just not going the way you are and linda you're right it, it's not like it's just the most pleasant journey jane corman you didn't have the most pleasant journey it was very painful and harsh yeah but you're like well you know i'm i have Blessings abound, I, you know, uh, there's strength, there's stuff out there for me to, to get. And I think we just have to untap, to tap that. And I think this is all of our, this experience here with these panelists, that's what gives us that, that ability to say, it's all within us. I, I um, wanted to ask Kathleen, if you could give an example of nonviolent communication, say, when your fuse is short and you're apt to snap at say a partner who has you know left his crap on the table again after you've asked him 25 times not to like if you could give an example of like how to take a deep breath and say something that's not violent yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it is a process, right? Um, to learn that, um, even to value the idea of not making a brash response. And, uh, you know, after some training about, um, that situation would call for, for what they call a nonviolent communication, self-empathy. And self-empathy is a process where you 
I mean, it sounds crazy, but we literally have a list of feelings and on the other side, a list of needs. And in self-empathy, you learn to get savvy about what's really going, what am I really feeling here? Um, and uh, it's funny because I just got in the mail, an email from one of my NVC people in my NVC group about there's something in NVC called jackaling and it's considered a necessary process in NVC where you get a chance to just lay it all out there to yourself, not to the person or to your other people who understand NVC, you rant, you rant. And then you find out in, in that script of ranting all the feelings that are present and all the needs that are present. And that begins to build empathy for yourself. Understanding your own self and having empathy for yourself is the first step. Mm -hmm. And so I got this email from somebody the other day that was had all of these lines of um, terrible things that get said <laughs> and that's called jackaling. And then this app, you could put in uh, a certain phrase and click and they, these people have worked on telling you what feelings and needs might be present in that thing that that person said. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's gotten a little bit sophisticated, but there's something so powerful about understanding. And again, self-compassion understanding what's happening, what's happening with me and that my feelings are valid and my feelings have to do with beautiful needs of mine that are unmet. And by the way, it's not anybody else's job to meet my needs, but I have to learn what they are and I have to honor the fact that I have them and I have to understand what's going on with me. So that would be a primer for that. You know, that would be a quick answer for that. Thanks for that question, Linda, I love it. Mm. Because it's definitely a time, as you said, with the, with irritability or just confusion. Because uh, it's you're confu your 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 body's confusing you. It's like this isn't how I usually feel, and um, and in the moment, it can be hard to take a step back and say, "Let me rationally, you know, say something." appropriate here that doesn't always happen and then things can escalate kind of quickly for sure absolutely that's yeah. the business of and of nonviolent communication that's what's taught yeah and so maybe it's cool maybe a, a wonderful pause to be taken is um jen harry's exercise of self-compassion might be the pause that's needed and then the self-empathy exploration could begin after that yeah yeah yeah, and also, I mean, thinking about your future self and and how you see yourself, you know, as an older woman, um, it's kind of, you know, it, it it may be sort of an abrupt reminder, but I think you know, continually having a conversation about where we see ourselves as we age, as we're aging. Um, you know, might be a healthy exercise is um, I, that's why I like the, the whole idea of um, letting go of this image we have of our self and our life and where we are going to be because we don't know and, and thinking about it in an energetic way that it's a, it's a, it's a flow is a much healthier way to, to approach things, I think. Yeah. Um, this is a question. Um, Thank you all. This was the most powerful of the three sessions for me. I think trusting this new self is a huge issue for me. What if I'm just hormonally manic? What if this isn't the real me? I'm just trying to get used to being at a perpetual crossroads. And this is where I keep bumping into my faith or the lack of. Could I respond to that? Yes. Sure. I, I was just sitting here thinking, um, kind of parallel thoughts because I, I was thinking about adolescence, which is another time when hormones kind of take over. And um, we spend a lot of time preparing young people for adolescence. You know, we do education to help them know what to expect when their body changes and their emotions are gonna be difficult and blah, 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 blah. Um, and when I was going through my perimenopausal experience, I had several different people say things to me like, don't let your hormones distract you or take over. 
Um, and I, I had people telling me not to trust what I was feeling because it was, quote, just hormones. Um, but I think teenagers are some of the smartest people in the world because whatever, you know, we, we see the hormonal state they're in as some kind of a lack or problem, but man, they know the truth and they say it, <laughs> you know, um, there's, and I, I don't know the physiological realities of all of that, but, um, when I was going through what I went through with leaving my husband and, and everything that happened, it was, I think it was kind of similar. And people were saying things like, don't make a terrible mistake because you're quote hormonal. And I don't necessarily think it is a mistake. Um, I don't fully understand why these things happen to us, but I do think they get us to where we need to be. And just trying to, you know, the, the word I keep coming back to over and over again is openness, like just being open to what's happening to you, um, listening to what you're learning about yourself as this process kind of takes over. Um, it's okay. And you can trust it. And it's, you know, even if it takes you to a place that you never expected or a place that you thought you didn't want to go, um, you're going to be okay on the other side. And I think it's very natural. Thank you, Jane. I, I agree. I think that's part of living. We don't, you know, we don't, things aren't just going to turn out like we always think they are. And um, and it's not self-compassion is, I think a lot of people say, well, I'm just going to say it's okay and nothing matters. That's not true. You do have to be responsible for choices you make and not every choice we make is particularly maybe the right one or not in our best interest at times. And we, everyone will have certain, uh, struggles, especially, um, with certain disorders like, um, alcoholism or those kinds of things where we have to, that's, those are special struggles that many people yeah. um, really have to deal with. And again, you don't know that outcome that, you know, those are not easy processes. Um, so I, I think that it's important to realize, as you have all said, that there is, there are things that are greater than our own little world or our own little mind just gets stuck in energy power god nature those are those are definitely bigger than than just you and but you're a, but you're a part of that and you can be a part of that i want to let everybody know that's attending that if you tap on the chat uh button on the bottom of your screen a lot of uh information will come up and that's everybody's websites. And also um, I wanna thank all of you so much um, for doing this and uh, a huge thank you to Jane Kornman, Jen Harry, Kathleen Bowman for today. Thank you, Linda and Julie for developing the series and making it happen. And thanks to the public relations department for offering all this uh, tech support and advertising. And thanks to everybody who's come here today. If you have any questions, never hesitate to contact any of us. Um, and again, the, these three episodes are available for viewing and reviewing. Um, I just wanna say that a presenter, uh, I mean, a, a presenter of the last session, which was Amelia uh, Brecker Demuro, and is a member of the Women's Health Center Advisory Committee is starting an online support group for female identified people ages 30 to 65 and it's called Fem Clutch. This is a professionally led support group and will explore stress, parenting, body image, value clarification, compassion, meeting twice a month virtually, starts tomorrow, April 1st. For more information that's in that chat uh, section, uh, contact Amelia directly. Uh, and she has a website, ameliabreckerdemuro.com. Um, Look at what we have. We have each other. We have a mindfulness walks. We have a support group. You, we all are so worth it. 
And there's so much love and compassion for you all to tap into. So peace and health to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.